This is the Scottish Club Rugby Podcast. The Scottish Club Rugby Podcast. With Stuart Cameron and Dale Clancy. Hello and welcome to the 8th edition of the Scottish Club Rugby Podcast and at this stage we still have four teams from the 50 clubs playing national rugby who are unbeaten, namely Ayr in National 1, Alan Glens and Orkney in National 3 and Garnock from National 4 who themselves are the only side with a 100% record including try bonuses so well done to them. Joining me as always is Dale Clancy and while it was a reduced fixture card last week as it was a designated standby date for Nationals 2, 3 and 4, some games were played in those divisions due to the uh, previous week's call-offs because of the bad weather but we're going to start as always with the Premiership and the results from Saturday and we'll start uh, in alphabetical order with Glasgow Hawks 57, Jed Forest 19. Jed still having a bit of a nightmare season due to their huge injury list but valuable points for Hawks who picked up their second win of the season. Yeah, I think, you know, we were speaking about it last week uh, about Jed Forrest and we all know how difficult a campaign that they've had and, you know, we can't keep repeating the same the same things. So it was always going to be difficult to go away from home and, and try and pick up some points. But we did speak about how important it was to try and get something. Unfortunately for Jed, they weren't able to pick up anything, but Glasgow Hawks have been able to get that victory. You know, we heard on the programme last week, there was a, the conversation about not being where they wanted to be. Other teams had stolen a march on them and it's, you know, the Hawks are playing catch up, but, you know, a, a great performance good win put on a got a lot of scores on the board as well so you know from a Glasgow Hawks point of view it was a, a, a good return Hoyt 27, Musselburgh 25. Musselburgh went to Mansfield Park unbeaten against the other three Borders teams with the aim of getting the clean sweep. And uh, they nearly pulled it off. 2010 up at one stage and a four-try bonus in the bag as well. Uh, Hoyt missing some regulars, it has to be said. But a good result for Musselburgh. And they'll be uh, disappointed that they only got two from it. Yeah, I think it's a good, it's probably a good result for both teams because Hoyt have been a really strong, good reaction after that defeat against Marr and obviously defeating Curry as well and it was probably a game that on paper you look at and you think there's a bit of a gulf between the two sides but Musselburgh competing really really well throughout the whole game likes of Ali Weir coming back for Hoyt at fly half yeah, which is I a, didn't see that happening neither did I <laughs> um, it's putting me to shame because I'm, I'm the same age as him so I'm sitting here um, doubling in size and he's looking uh, very lean and in shape and slotting back into first team rugby you know and it just shows you the success that Hoyk have had it's bringing players back as well and that's what happens if you create a good culture at any club you know people want to get involved and Ali Weir's went back in and you know got himself involved with Hoyk but ultimately it's another win for Hoyk and it, it, especially with the way that the results went at the weekend you know it's uh, it's certainly keeping them in the hunt and we don't mention him that often, and we should do more. I think Kirk Ford at fullback, Mister Reliable with the boot. Yeah, I think Kirk Ford is. Um, it's, it's it's true what you say. You know, we don't mention him too much, um, but he is an unsung hero in that in that team. He's he's really steady. He's so laid back, and when you watch him play, he he, he looks unflappable. He looks like he's never going to be rattled, or he creates time for himself. He kicks accurately off the tee and from the hand. And the good balance that Hoyt have, because when you've got the likes of Kirk Ford in there, is, uh, Kirk Ford and you've got uh, Kyle Brunton at 10, you've got two players that can pretty much play first receiver as well. And they use a lot of Sean Muir as well, you know, at first receiver and some of their forwards. So they've got quite a well-skilled, you know, team throughout from 1 to 15. But Kirk Ford gives them a good bit of balance and, you know, a bit of calmness behind, which, which you need, especially at Premiership, because the tactical battle and trying to kick for territory and possession, you need somebody behind there that, you know, it's going to be steady under the high ball, but also is going to be able to make the right decisions. And that'll do Musselburgh the world a good as well, won't it? I mean, their only really big uh, issue this uh, season so far was uh, losing at home to Curry by uh, quite a considerable margin. But uh, as we've said earlier, they drew with Kelso. They've uh, beaten Selkirk away, beaten Jed Forrest as well, at Jed Forrest. Yeah, th- you, you think about those results and, and perhaps... You know, this is in the early in the season. These big, these big score lines you can perhaps kind of gloss over because it's still teams settling in and, and taking a bit of time. You, as we've said, you know, the league is certainly settling out, and for a Musselburgh point of view, it's settling out in a really favourable position. They're, you know, in the top half of the league. They're able to, um, you know, start to mount a little bit of pressure towards the teams above them because I've said before, Mar, Curry, and Hoyk are the three standout teams in that division. Okay, so they're nailed on I would say for the top three places the way that Edinburgh Ackies have been playing they were my fourth and I just you know they, they obviously we'll come on to it shortly obviously not a great weekend for them but they're then 
given this fourth place up for grabs because Musselburgh are playing really well, getting results. Heriots are getting results, and then Brackies need to start chasing and, and chasing down the teams ahead of them. Musselburgh have got a great had a great start to the season, you know, especially off the back of what they were what they're playing like last year. Well, let's come to that, Enbrackies one. That's next on the list. Kelso 32, Enbrackies 22. Second time this season that Kelso have bounced back from big defeats. And as you mentioned, it was uh, against Marr and it was uh, against Hoik. Uh, they still got Curry to play next week, but we'll be talking about that uh, very shortly. But to actually bounce back from huge defeats and, and get points, they were 22-10 down uh, against Enbrackies came back with a try bonus to win comfortably. Yeah, and I think that's uh, it's almost the kind of yin and yang from the Selkirk game. They were in control of that game and then almost threw it away slightly. You know, they, they got themselves in a good position to see the game out, not able to, to see it through. But in this game here, you know, they've been able to react and, and come back and get a, a really handsome victory, which we always, we've always we always said Kelso at Poinder Park, any team in the Premiership to be fair, but Kelso at Poinder Park are difficult to play. They were difficult to play in that one last year. They were difficult to play in the board league as well you know in the, the double headed fixtures as well that they were able to you know put in some good performances over the last few years and into the premiership they've been able to continue that form you know they've been hooked by Hoik but apart from that they've been involved in a lot of really interesting intriguing games and you know Kelso will be happy because last week you heard Neil speaking about um, the fact that they're not where they wanted to be they've obviously set targets and it was about getting results now and last weekend they managed to get the result and it's a huge one for them and very hard to bounce back from big defeats like that so I mean you know mentally they, they, they're in the right place yeah t- t- totally because you know after you're defeated by a team in the same division as you and it's a and it's a I think it's either a last minute defeat or if it's a heavy margin of defeat your confidence is low and to get you know that's plaudits to the coaching staff and the culture they've got at Kelso because to be able to galvanize your squad again and go again the next weekend in a positive mindset and turn it around from being behind you know that shows great character from the Kelso squad because it's new territory for most of them in that team not a lot of them have played premiership rugby some of them have got oodles of experience at Premiership Rugby but they start to then build this experience and that's a, and you know, another great one for the, the guys from Poinder. Mar 34 Curry 28 that was the big game at uh, the top end of the table in the Premiership a big win for Mar who have now beaten Hoyk and Curry at home they've obviously got to uh, travel and meet them again which could be a different story we will find out later in the season sets it up nicely though and a valuable late try for Curry because that gave them two bonus points Yeah I think you know, it's going to be vital to pick up as many points as you can in in the league because, as you know, obviously it, it culminates in a playoff system at the end of the season. So I think it's important what you say there. Firstly, actually, the game, you know, Mar Curry, it was a huge game. It, it, it swung away. Curry, you know, had control of that game from bits from what I was listening to and the coverage from, from Robin and Andrew as well. Curry looked like they were in control and there was almost just a, a shift. Mar took the bull by the horns and went for it. Got a couple of scores, you know, perhaps a couple of decisions in there which irked them as well. And it was like Vicano with a with a huge challenge that could have potentially ended up in a different colour of card, but it seemed to galvanise Mar and got themselves in a great position. So, but as you say, it's two wins at home for Mar. Difficult place to go, but it's two wins at home. You know, when they get to the turn in this campaign, it's now going to show what kind of character they've got when if they can travel away and go to Mileni and go to Mansfield and pick up those wins because they're going to end up being the the results which will decide who's going to get the home playoffs. Selkirk 13, Heritz Blues 26, and that win puts Heritz Blues into third place with, surprisingly, just a plus nine points difference. Yeah, I think, you know, you look at last season and potentially Heritz and Musselburgh have changed places with Hawks and Selkirk, really. Selkirk almost making it into that fourth place. Um, Hawks were there and thereabouts for most of the season I think they had pretty much that game at Mansfield um, pretty much took them away from the playoffs I felt last year um, but then you look this year and you, you've you've got Musabra who are riding high, Heriots who are now in the playoff zone, we've got a long way to go but you know they've had a great start to the season in, in that playoff zone and they'll be looking to try and maintain that, it's amazing what wins and confidence can do for a club so it has been a bit of a shift in terms of those those two teams or those four teams almost trading places but uh, yeah it'll be interesting to see if Heriots can sustain that, I think the, the, the team that they've got you know, when you're looking at it on social media when it's coming through, it is strong. You know, they they have benefited from a lot of players that are playing super series and covering as well and coming back into the team. And, you know, it, it, it's a competitive environment, I think, at Golden Acre just now. And, and I looked at the other week and, they, you know, they had first, seconds, thirds, women's team out and they're absolutely thriving at Golden Acre. So, you know, to back that up with good results on the pitch as well is a testament to the club. Now, without looking at the league table, only two clubs have six try bonus points. 
Which two? Good question. Um, which two? Which two? Which two? Marcelbra is correct. And I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Heriots. Yeah, is it? Oh, absolutely well done. right. Oh, brilliant. Spot on. Well done. You didn't even look. No, I didn't actually. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. That's very, very impressive. But, but surprising. It is surprising, really? but I think over the last few weeks we have been speaking about you know how many tries they have been scoring and they've been they've been able to turn that tide. I think last year they were in you know they were getting defeated heavily, and it was their point accumulation that was perhaps seen obviously in rugby, eh, but their point accumulation was seeing them come off second best on most occasions. They've turned that, and I just think their squads. I, I've not looked too much at Musselburgh, as I must add. You know, like I've seen the results coming through. And I need to look at it a little bit cl- more closely in terms of their change from last year. But Heriots do have a, a stronger squad when you look at it. And I think that players are really benefiting from the success of their Super Series club. And I think Super Series has been something which some people like, some people don't. But I think it's helped club rugby. It's even stuff out for a few years. But those players in time are, are thriving from being in a more competitive environment. And that was a club towards the foot of the Premiership. They've been in the National Division. So they were at the foot of the Premiership and they're then in a better competitive environment. And it's improving their players. It obviously is. And Musselburgh last season, of course, did score a lot of tries in, in the early part of the season in, in particular. So Musselburgh didn't surprise me so much. The fact that Heritage Blues are on there with a plus nine points difference was the one that uh, surprised me. But let's have a look at the league table then. So Mar at the top with 30 points. That's played 7-1-6. Hoyk in second with 27. Heritage Blues in third, 25. Curry, who have played one game less in fourth position on 22. Musselburgh in fifth on uh, 21. Enbrackies in sixth with 19 Kelso in seventh on 16 Glasgow Hawks eighth place 13 points Selkirk ninth with 11 and Jed Forrest at the bottom with just two try bonus points so Curry and Hawks game in hand Jed nine points adrift our live commentary game this Saturday is Jed Forrest against Mars so we'll no doubt be finding out a little bit more on how soon they're expecting players to return and we all know if they get their best team on the park then um, you know they could start picking up wins but they need to get them back. Yeah, I do, I do think it's going to take a lot to turn the tide. It's a competitive league. You know, there, it, there's no easy games in this league and we've seen it already this season. Um, but Jed Forrest, I think even welcoming some players back, it's going to take a lot, especially with Mar at home. You know, I, I remember covering a game at Riverside. It was Mar, Jed, and Mar blew them away. That was, was Shedden on the Jamie, way, scoring four tries. Jamie yeah. Shedden, who's now playing for Ayrshire Bulls and doing really well. You know, so... He was, he's a really good player, uh, don't get me wrong, but Mars' squad now is still equally as strong and, and, and Jed are perhaps a little bit weaker. And I just do think players like so Gregor Law, who's an important player for Jed, that they perhaps can't, you know, call on him just now. Um, and it's a shame. And, and just the inconsistencies in the squad, the, you know, moving players into scrum half and then not having the same half-back partnership, maybe not the same centres, different back, back row, different front row. We have said it though, it's going to benefit the young players coming through to play Premiership, play in this environment, but it's just, it's been a difficult start to the campaign and it's difficult to try and encourage players back as well, but you know, hopefully we see some of Jed's best players back on the pitch and, and contributing in, in, uh, you know, in, uh, for the rest of the season, but it's going to take a lot to, to be competitive. Jed Forrest and Mar, though, it's always been one of those fixtures, I mean, back in the National One days as well, the two of them going head-to-head, uh, a lot of clashes on and off the field over the over the years as well, but always very competitive and a great occasion. Yeah, it's always been competitive. I've, I think I've seen a few um, a few reels of fights after games and what have you, but it's uh, that's rugby, and it's great with rugby as well because you see that on the pitch and then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're in the bar having a drink or they're all chatting after a game and it is, it's good. It's it's so obviously, obviously sometimes quite unsavoury to see in the park if there's something a little bit too far, but, you know, a lot of the times it's done in the heat of the battle and the frustration. I, I just think that on a rugby level just now, the, the two teams are, are, are poles apart. You know, the, the, the league dictates that as well. You know, it shows how far they are apart and um, it'll be interesting to see the squad when it comes out. We'll be talking about that one in a second in more detail. But this week, a full programme expected. And we'll start with Curry against Kelso. And uh, we're going to hear from Kelso Director of Rugby, Neil Hinnigan. A uh, trip on Saturday to Malmey Park to play Curry, uh, which will be a, a difficult task. Obviously, they're going well and uh, just missed out away to Mar last week. So they like to play fast and uh, they play a good offloading game. So we're going to have to be defensively well organised. And that's... What we've been working on mainly this week is trying to 
to, to keep that up because it paid dividends last week against Arkies. We managed to stay in the game this time for for uh, for long enough to have an opportunity to to come back at Arkies and from 22 10 down to winning the game uh, 32 22 in the end was very pleasing. Um, so yeah, it was a good result, good five points. But moving on to Curry, we it was a bruising encounter last week, so we there's a lot of players dropping out. Murray Woodcock drops out. Terry Logan drops out. Hamish Tweedy is out as well. Liam Tate and coming is uh, Angus Hutterson comes in for Hamish. He's looking at his first Premiership game, so hopefully he gets a, a run off the bench. James Glendinning comes in to the back row. Grant Shields comes back out of the bench. Angus McGregor keeps his place at loose head, so that's a credit to him after his performance last week. Alan Frame starts at hooker and Ewan Knox goes to the bench. Quite a lot of changes in there, obviously, so the injury list is getting fairly big, but um, we've also got to look ahead after Curry. We have Jed Forrest and Musselburgh at home, so they're going to be two big games for us. And uh, it's just about trying to manage the squad through this period of time that's going to be um, obviously very important to our season. So it's not an easy one and it's a hard match for us away to Curry, there's no doubt about it. But um, as I say, the young youthful team we're taking and some of the, the, the older heads it's a good mixture and I'm sure we can give a good account of ourselves. Neil Hennigan well Kelso not fared too well so far against Hoyke and Marg, as we mentioned Curry will be a big test for them although Curry have lost their last couple of games but uh, but they're back at home. Yeah I think they'll be happy to get back at home you know not one in three games essentially one postponed two defeats um, so yeah home comforts will, will suit Curry in this game let's not beat around the bush on paper, uh, Curry, who have been competing at the top level of the Premiership for the last few years, are stronger than Kelso. Um, but I do expect it to be a tighter game. I don't expect it to be one of those games where Curry are at home and they win by 50 points. Um, I think Kelso are have started to settle into life in the Premiership and they'll be well directed, they'll be well guided. You can hear Neil there in terms of the task at hand, you know, speaking about the fact that they, they know it's going to be a difficult game, but they'll go well drilled, well coached, and they'll go in with a game plan and want to frustrate Curry. Like, Curry are going to be attritional, they're going to be hard up front, but Kelso equally, you know, have got a really good pack and, and some good players in behind the scrum as well. So it'll be intriguing, but you would also probably nod to, to Curry starting that one as favourites. Hoyk versus Harriet's Blues. Great history between the cl- two clubs, of course, and uh, the Blues doing OK at the moment in third place with four wins. Here are the thoughts of Hoyk head coach Matty Douglas. Yeah, look, we're really excited to get back um, back in action this weekend against Harriet. Um, coming back off, off the back of a win last week, we could probably be lying if I said that the performance was where it needed to be. Um, first half, we we just struggled to match Musselburgh. Um, to credit to Musselburgh, they had a, a clear game plan and we just didn't match them and they played some, some decent rugby at times. And going down the tunnel, 20 points to 10 down, um, you know, we haven't been in that situation since the Mar game and, and we had some stern words at half time. You know, the players knew that it wasn't where it needed to be. And second half, credit to them, we've came out and reacted and I uh, thought we got back into the game well and managed it. Um, look, I could make excuses that we had five or, or six players missing and, you know, having a, you know Dan starting at hooker, um, you know, let alone first game for Hoyt, but first game in the Premiership. So, um, look, we we just weren't at the races at times, and um, you know that's been the the challenge this week is to just rectify a few little things and and get excited for this weekend. We're at home again. Um, I, I feel that we've got a little bit of um, you know a bit of performance to put put in front of the home crowd. As last week, we we didn't do that. So Harriet's are a, a quality side. Um, they're they're sitting at two points below us in third. So look, this is our top of the table clash. You know, however you look at it, we we need to win on Saturday. We need to keep the pressure on at the top. Um, Harriet's have have won at Selkirk last week and um, won some big games this season. So look, they'll be confident after winning on the road for the first time last week. So we need to be ready for it. Um, you know, looking at selection wise. There, there's another five or six players who come back in to into this that that, that selection um, meeting this week, so we'll we'll be looking at it and and we'll be looking to put the strongest team on the part that we can, and and try and rectify a few of the the issues that we didn't quite get right last week. But again, it's always um, you know the following week you get a chance to put things right, and and we'll certainly be looking to do that at Mansfield. Matty Douglas, likely to be a much stronger Hoyt team this week, which uh, should make the difference, but Herrick's Blues, as we said, going well. Yeah, going really well. I, I, I think you, you can only go off what you 
what you see in the previous performance and it's like the old coach's adage is you're only as good as your last game and Hoyk were good enough to get the victory uh, perhaps not as polished as everybody's expected them to be but they managed to get the victory and that's what's happened at Hoyk last season that was built off their success you know tight games that they were able to get out the get out the other end with a victory so this could be another interesting game you know Heriots have been scoring tries they'll look to stretch Hoyk and get their big pack moving about the pitch so you know they've obviously got that in their in their arsenal to to try and frustrate and upset Hoyk. I just think about you know obviously off the back of that muscle performance um, and not so much the performance but the result. You know we were alluding to it last week and I probably I said quite frank that I would expect them to come out the other end with about fifteen points and I wouldn't be surprised how tight that game was. It's going to be interesting to see how this game goes because. We've got to think about the end of the season after the turn. Three games all the way from home. Musselburgh, Heriots and then a border derby against Selkirk at Philippoch. So, you know, that's a difficult end to the season for Hoyk. So it's probably paramount that they pick up uh, full points, at least from this game. And so Jed Forrest against Marr. Top versus bottom at Riverside Park. Already 28 points between the two sides and some great battles between the two over the years, as we mentioned. Marr obviously will start favourites, but let's listen in on what both coaches have to say about the match, starting with Jed's David Grieve and then Kenny Diffenthal from Marr. On Saturday, we were up at Glasgow Hawks and not for the first time this season, we were late call-offs, which it's really putting us on the back foot before the game's even started. Um, it's far from ideal. The game itself, uh, first 20, 25 minutes, really competitive. Then kind of after that, the Hawks got two tries before half time. But even at half time, all the talk was positive. Uh, we felt we had a lot to play for still. But unfortunately, second half, uh, the, the floodgates opened. Uh, we weren't at the races at all. It was a, it was a really disappointing afternoon for us. Uh, again, we picked up a couple injuries. Um, it's it's far from ideal the situation we're in at the moment. We just kind of have to get on with it. Um, this week we've got Mar at home. Hopefully there'll be two or three boys back for injury for us, especially in the backs. But again, you have to kind of wait and see. This just not having a settled squad this season's really it's really affecting us. We know a bit of work on things at training. It's just. If it wasn't for bad luck, we'd have no luck at all. That's kind of how we feel. Um, but we just have to go out there. But we've got nothing to lose. Have a go and just kind of see what happens. This last weekend against Curry was a tough game. Boys played really well. Really happy with the result and how the boys showed character in the second half. And then finishing off the game with a really, really good defensive set um, to keep them out. Which is very happy, happy to see that. This week uh, versus Jed will be very tough. We are under no illusions um, what a battle it's going to be. We've had a few battles over the years and we're expecting nothing less this weekend. It's a tough, tough place to go and play rugby. Um, so we need full focus and commitment this weekend. Kenny Diffenthorn, before that it was uh, David Grieve of the uh, coaching staff at Jed Forest. Home advantage for Jed, of course, which they'll they'll enjoy, but Mar will see this certainly as a big chance to get another five points in the bag against the bottom team. Yeah, I think they will. You know, it's difficult because I don't, as I said before, I don't want to potentially kick a team when they're down um, because they've, they've had a really difficult start to the season, but you've got to look at what it is and, you know, Mar are going into this game It'd be good form, uh, some good results that they've had so far this season, especially off the back of a, a really tough win against one of their nearest uh, rivals in the league for, you know, they want to get their second Premiership crown. So, you know, that's realistic. Jed are struggling to survive in this division at the moment. So, you know, they'll be hoping to try and pick up something at home. We have said home form counts. And at the moment, Jed just haven't been able to make that count at all. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a, going to be a difficult weekend, I think. You know, I, I, you look at it and you've got to say that Mar start that is, is real heavy favourites because Hoyk went there and, and put on a sizeable victory in some challenging conditions. So, you know, I, I don't doubt that Jed will, you know, put in a good performance and try again and, and, and try and, and really put in a, a good shift to get something from the game. But it's it's going to be an uphill battle in that 80 minutes. Musselburgh against Glasgow Hawks, that's fifth against eighth. Hawks yet to win away from home this season. Musselburgh with three wins and a draw. And uh, here's Hawks head coach Andy Hill. Firstly, we've got to be happy with the win v Jed at the weekend. You know, at the end of the day, it was a bottom of the table clash, which we've come out the better side of quite convincingly. And we have to realise that if we've got aspirations of being where we want to be, this is the teams that we need to go away and look to try and be beaten. Uh, so it was good to obviously get that result. And it's, it's tough for Jed at the moment because we've been in that situation where 
you know, you're getting guys back fit and then losing more. Uh, the first year we were in the Premiership, it was our most difficult year. And so we've got to obviously I feel a wee bit sorry for, for them. But anyway, we have to move on to next week and we have to try and look at starting, obviously moving ourselves up the table, as I say, if we've got aspirations of where we want to be at this halfway point and looking to try and get string together a few results because in this league, you know, MD can beat anybody in the day, but it's kept about consistency and it's about backing up these wins to try and get two or three in the throw. And that's where the likes of Curry and Mar and Hoyt the last few years have just been really consistent at doing that and being able to back up these results. So that's what we need to start looking to try and do over the course of this week and moving forward. Uh, I feel as if we are in a, a pretty good uh, position just now. I feel as if the cancellation D Curry actually helped us in terms of even though we, we thought the game was going to be on the Saturday, it allowed us to try and implement some bit of shape. It might allow us to kind of really forget about the Kelso victory with a bit of a ha- sorry Kelso loss. It was a bit of a hangover from, and it allowed us to then go away and work on some of the things that we think will make a difference to us across the course of the the, the campaign. So going away and work on a bit of defence and attack the shape that we we feel that we want to try and implement the stuff that we'd put into pre season. But as ever with Hawks, we've got a lot of new guys coming in, which makes things quite challenging. And so. Some of those guys are in key positions and that's allowed them to come out, you know, pick up to speed what we're trying to do as a team and as a squad. Another thing about the cancellation was is it's probably the most difficult part of being a club where so many new guys come in, is that I'll actually allow the boys to get together on the Saturday night to go away, watch Scotland play Ireland and a lot of Irish boys in our team as well, have a beer together, you know, enjoy each other's company and then all of a sudden become really part of a squad because that's where, you know, the likes uh, these kind of towns that we play against from the borders or, you know, Communities like Ma and this weekend Musselburgh, you know that is where we would love to be in their position. Whereby you've got a a core group of you know twenty thirty players that are there every single year that you can just build round about and you know what you're getting in and you can start to add to game plan. Whereas we're trying to refresh things uh, and go over things every single year. So that's obviously been the criticism for us. You know from the likes of Musselburgh in the past, you know, we're a bit of an academy side, we get all the better players, but you know, we'd love to be in their position of having the chance to go away and build on those things. And I felt as if that weekend off E Curry allowed us to go away and, and do that as a as a squad. I feel as if when we're looking to, towards this game, there's that, you know, Musselburgh playing really, really well. Uh, they're playing a real identity. They're a, a real physical side when you watch them, you know, they actually look quite similar to the way that in which you know Mar play really quite a physical side. You know, you've got the, the kind of Watt brothers there that are doing really well on the backs. Are given you know some front foot ball and and then you've got the likes of Michael Badenhorst and the likes coming around the corner to try and get themselves back over the game line and just put build pressure and pressure and that's what we need to be prepared for over the weekend to, to try and match that physical uh, aspect to the game which we normally pride ourselves on and we've been trying to make sure we get back to our best of that I still think we're a wee bit off but that's one of the things we've been working on and in training as well and I think it's going to be really important going looking at the weather forecast for this weekend where it's due to be an absolute monster uh, a downpour across you know from Thursday to Saturday so we're well aware that that's going to impact obviously the type of rugby that's going to be allowed to be played and that's what we need to try and focus on Feels as if we're quite settled at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, Paul Cairn crosses out after picking up a head knock. Uh, good news is he's kind of passed the scat test, so he will hopefully be looking to be back for next weekend. And then the other one is uh, Harry Proven is away on holiday after impressing. You know, a guy, a kid out of school doing so, so well. I'm sure he's going to be in Scotland under 20s radars already because he comes uh, with a real good pedigree as well. However, as a squad, we're, you know, we're getting... But I feel as if we're close to having you know, almost everybody fit, which has been so uncharacteristic of us at this point in the year. Uh, you know, we've got Sam Graham back this week. We, we think don't think Wayne Burrows is going to make it, but he'll probably be fit for next week. And then the only other guys that are left injured are guys that look as if they're going to be long term in the likes of Liam Brims, uh, Matthew Stewart and Murray Oliver and Tom McTeer, who's just waiting on an operation. So it feels as if we're in a good spot, but this is going to be a massive challenge for us to go away and try and back up uh, wins against each other at Stony Hill. Musselburgh are going to look to try and keep pushing on up that league. Andy Hill of Glasgow Hawks. Now, Musselburgh would be certainly buoyed by their two points and almost a win at Mansfield Park last weekend, while Hawks racking up the tries last weekend will have plenty of confidence. Yeah, this is a really interesting fixture because I think that fourth place has just been blown right open. Um, I, I did have, I had a nailed on, I had a nailed on top four. Those top three could have been in any place, and then I thought Edinburgh Brackies would sneak fourth. But you know, now it has been with the form of all the teams, it's been blown open. So that makes this game huge because Musselburgh have started tremendously. You know, even you think about their character in a game that they should never have won at Philippe, were able to 
sneak away with a victory. You know, and you've got to, it's a marathon, you've got to put points on the board and, you know, Musselburgh have put on a good tally so far. Hawks, on the other hand, Andy Hill last week was knowing that he's given every other team a head start. I think they realistically still think they can get in that top four. You can't bet against them because it's, it, there's not a lot separating those teams towards that fourth position. There's going to be some defeats for those clubs on the road to you know the, the, the 18th game of the season as well. So this is going to be a really interesting one because I think that one of the other teams can, can steal a march on the other. There's a race to the top four now. You know I think the three teams are probably nailed on. So that's going to be quite boring for everybody. But the three teams at the top are going to be nailed on. But it's going to be interesting that you can see you get in that fourth position because it can be any one of four teams. And Musselburgh almost like the same place that Jed Forrest were at this stage last season. They were kind of comfortable. They were out of the relegation zone. They could relax a bit more and, and enjoy their rugby. And I think the same is really happening now with Musselburgh because they've earned the right to be in that position. There is going to almost be, I would say, four leagues, like little mini leagues in this division. There's going to be the top three battling out to see who can get their home semis. There's going to be the race for the top four. And then there's going to be a little clutch of teams that at some point this season are going to realise they've just got to play games to see the season out. And unfortunately, as, as cruel as it sounds, I do think if Jed don't start picking up wins, they'll be in a league of their own. You know, they'll, they'll be towards the foot of the table and it's going to take a monumental effort to get out of it. I don't say that with any pleasure at all. I do not want to see that. I want to see a competitive league and get them getting back up as well. But, you know, on the balance of things so far, that's what we could almost be looking at. So from a Musselburgh point of view, they've played themselves in a really good position and it'll be about maintaining that continuity and making sure that they can continue to pick up results to make their matches meaningful and press to be in towards that second little league in that in that division is going for that top four. It's going to be interesting, anyway, because obviously we're going to be there, Jed Forrest against Marr, and we'll be able to hear a bit more, I think, in depth of uh, how things are, are rolling at Jed and when they're going to get the players back and all that kind of stuff. And uh, hopefully they, they've got a positive two-thirds of the, uh, of the season to go. It's never good to see a club struggle, especially at the top flight and the top division. But, but someone's got to go down. Yes, and that's the difficulty. And especially in these 10-team leagues, you know, the Premiership's been won down for a while, but one club has to go down. And I think you're going to see a lot of settling throughout the whole landscape of the national leagues over the next few years because it's difficult to go up and it's difficult to go down because there's only one up, one down. So, you know, if you do find yourself cut adrift, Jed Forrest might then have to start to take stock and prepare for a season down next year. We've got a long way to go. Don't get me wrong. There's there's not a huge gulf between them yet. But if it keeps going the way it has gone and we get to the turn and, and they're they're not in touching distance, then you can only see one outcome. But yeah, I don't say it with any great delight because I've got a lot of respect for Jed. I've got a lot of respect for clubs that volunteer and, and serve their community so well. You know, I think rugby clubs are the best place for young individuals to learn a lot of lessons. Um, I certainly did. And I think it's a, a place where, you know, youngsters can thrive. There's just not enough of them coming through the doors at the moment. And hopefully, the way that's been going on the pitch this season for a club like Jed Forrest, it's not something that then can it permeates through the rest of their club and I'm sure it doesn't because they've got a great history OK, Selkirk against Edinburgh Ackies back at home again for Selkirk this weekend against an Ackies team who'll be hurting from throwing away a 12-point lead at Kelso last week both trying to get back to winning ways here's Selkirk boss Sesh Henderson We're looking forward to this week's game um, Edinburgh Ackies at home got another home game um, that you know we're desperate to put up performance and, and get, get over the line and get another win um, last week we had opportunities and, um, you know, we're disappointed we never took them, you know, um, a few injuries early doors didn't help their, their structures, but however, you know, we worked hard to get back into the game and, you know, we could have, we could have got something out of it and we should have done, um, fair play to Heriots, they took their chances uh, and, you know, they got over the line and just, we worked really hard for eight minutes and disappointed we never got any, anything out of it, you know, but, but this week, um, you know, Embrack has been a tough game. You know they'll be hurting after getting beat at Kelso last week. And we need to go out there and, and really show real determination and intent uh, to attack and our defence and and take opportunities when they come. You know and stop their stop them from having opportunities. Keep our keep our discipline and you know, we're desperate to put that performance in and get over the line, get another win, uh, which will you know hopefully will restart our season again. We're getting so close, but we're just not getting any rewards for for hard work. We're looking to put in that kind of hard work again this this Saturday against Hackies and, and and see what happens. But, uh, you know, we're work, still working hard. The boys are working hard. They're still really keen, buzzing for Saturday. Another, you know, we'll try and get a, a home win, you know. You know, we're getting good crowds along and they, they, they deserve it. Um, so 
looking forward to it and uh, let's see what happens. Sesh Henderson, well, one of those matches that's hard to predict. Selkirk beat Kelso at Pointer Park recently, whilst Aki's couldn't do that. Yeah, this is a, a game that you've got to say that Enraki's must win. Um, away from home, they need to, to bounce back and, and pick up a victory to try and get back in touch with that top four race because a, another defeat, if they, if you're getting to eight games and you've lost five, it's it's not been a great start to the season. I, uh, and again, I'm saying this about Selkirk and I'll, I'll get slated for it as well, but I don't realistically see Selkirk being in that position to get into the top four. They're potentially going to be in that little league at the bottom come a point in a few games' time where they are playing games for developing for next year or, or just you know playing them for club and you know just to obviously contribute to what they're meant to be doing as clubs in a premiership so I don't see them competing so they can really put a span on the works here I think that they're going to Selkirk are going to go for the rest of the season they're going to win some games they're going to lose some games um, but Edinburgh Aki's realistically have been spoken about quite a lot in terms of that top four race so it's a, I think it's a vital game for Edinburgh Aki's. Let's move to National 1 then and the results from last week, starting with Air 25, GHA 23, a last gasp win for Air after being 14 points down, remember. GHA kicking themselves, no doubt, but Air finding a way to win and they've been doing that all season. For instance, at Bigger earlier. Bigger, Gala, what's on ends? All those games, at some point in that fixture, they've been, it's been squeaky bum time and every single time they've been able to pull away. And this is a game against a GHA team who have been playing at the top level of club rugby for a long time and obviously know the importance of the fixture. Not had the best start to their season, but they're obviously able to perform and get up for this fixture against Ayr. So, you know, it's a, another big victory. And I, I do see, you know, injuries and availability of players comes into it. But, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we're talking about Ayr being undefeated come game 16-17 because they've been that impressive. And that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because we have been talking about Air, almost putting them on a pedestal this season, uh, probably because we've seen Gala and Melrose fall away a wee bit. But it's the fact, as you say, that even in a tough finish, they find the way over that winning line, and, and that's special. Yeah, and I, and I totally agree, you know, but you you kind of look at the makeup of their squad with obviously Reese coming back. Potty is brilliant in the back row, and Pete McCallum as well. You know he's an experienced player that's won the Premiership, won cups for Air. He has been a, a brilliant player for Air, and then into the back McCluskey, Bova. You know those names are players who should be playing Premiership rugby still. Um, so obviously it's taken a bit of time for Air for the kind of sediment to settle after Super Series and and what have you. But they they seem to have their act together this year and and they look like they mean business. And I just think that you know even the, those difficult games you turn to those experienced players to drag you over the line, and that then seeps through to the rest of those young players because you learn a lot off of those experienced heads. If you've got a young squad, it's difficult. You can only see in the Super Series, if you've got a young squad, how difficult it is. You know, once your head's down, it's down, and some teams don't let off. But when you look at club rugby, you're littered with players who have been professionals, came back to their club, or players that have stayed there for a while, they've been up and down the leagues with their clubs. They've got so much experience to pass on to these teammates and, and friends that, you know, error reap the benefits this year. And we'll hear from Grant Anderson very, very shortly. But uh, Bigger 19, Dundee 24 at the weekend. Zero wins from six games now for Bigger. And Dundee have now actually won three times out of the six. You know, they've just not been able to get those results at all. And I, I backed them at the weekend. I thought, I did say, I said, there's going to be a victory coming at some point and it'll get tighter at the bottom of that league. When you started looking at some of the results, the, the, you then go out the equation going, there must be something else going on. You even look at sometimes the second team comes out and they've not got as many players available as you perhaps would anticipate. Um, so obviously there's there, there's potentially a lack of players there as well, but you know, they've still got a lot, of, a lot of talented rugby individuals there um, that are that are playing for for bigger, and they're another team that have perhaps you know some players have went and moved on elsewhere to play their rugby. So you know they're almost the kind of you know the victims of their own success at times. But this season just not being able to pick up those results, and we did back them against Dundee. Um, we obviously said Dundee are going through that period of transition and trying to sell, but a big victory on the road away from one of your rivals. They've bigger now need to, you know, dust themselves down at some point. They're going to have to go back up to Dundee and they're going to have to pick up a victory because Dundee have already beat them on their own patch. So, you know, big games coming for bigger. There's going to be some huge, huge encounters coming up soon.
Gal 18, Highland 22, and another win on the road from Highland, which is impressive. But again, like here, they had to come from 18-3 down to win. And they scored three tries in the last 10 minutes from all reports uh, to do that. Highland stay second, Gala down to eighth. Yeah, this was a, a game that was really going to signal the you know Highland's intent this year. We said about travelling away from home. We said it a bigger, but I thought the Gala game was probably more a barometer because you know just Gala have been a little bit more steady than bigger so far. Uh, but Highland have been able to come to the borders and a big pitch as well, throw the ball around and, and, and go away with the victory. So, you know, that's a, a huge, huge game for the a, a huge win for them. And it does keep them in touch with air at the top. You know, and I think that before the weekend you were looking at the league thinking that if Highland weren't able to pick up that victory, Air can almost put their dinner suits on and put their feet up because they're they're almost coasting after that. But you know, because Highland picked up that victory, it does keep them in touch and distance. And that's somewhere that they'll have to stay constantly until the end of the season, put pressure on air and hope they slip up because, you know, that's that's what they're, they're going to need to do. So still some big tests on the road for Highland to come, but that's one of them passed. Well, air came back uh, from being behind. Highland came back from being behind. What about this one? GHK 40, Watsonians 40. And if Gala were beating themselves up over uh, throwing a 15-point lead away, what on earth will Watsonians be thinking after being 33-5 adrift and letting GHK back in the match to make up a 28-point deficit? I remember hearing that result coming through in your coverage at the weekend um, and hearing that like Watsonians were coasting. It's one of those games that you kind of you hear the result and you go, right, OK. And you put, you're already putting your mind to Watsonians win. So to see the final result come through was phenomenal. A great, great fight back. You know, to come back against a team that stuck 40 points on you anyway, you know, to be able to reply and come back and, and snatch it, it's, it's a huge, huge effort from, from GHK. So I applaud it to them. And that's two games this season where that... It's kind of happened. Remember, Stu Mel were at home to Kakodi, wasn't it? And um, I mean, they had a similar lead. I think it was about thirty-three points to five. And then uh, <laughs> the competitiveness of uh, of these matches is fantastic. So forty points to forty. That one, a very high-scoring draw. I don't think I've heard of many above that. Melrose twenty-eight. Glasgow, Aki's 62. Now, Aki's hit 60 points for the second match in a row, but hands up if you thought it would be at the Green Yards against Melrose, because Aki's 28-7 up early on. Melrose came back to make it 28 each, and then 32 unanswered points from Aki's to go back to Glasgow with, with all five points. Yeah, I was I was really surprised by that result, and we did say as well that it was a, a fixture that, that Melrose had to win. To have any realistic hope of getting promoted, I, I do think you can almost write them off now, which is, uh, you know, they're almost double the points tally away from air and they're relying on air to slip up. And then after that, they're relying on Highland to slip up. So, you know, it's going to be a huge task to get back into this now. They've got a young squad at the Green Yards, got a lot of young players that they're, are some are tasting their, their, their first kind of years in senior rugby they've got some experienced players as well they've lost a lot of players as well Cruikshank and Doby obviously in the front row which is huge in National 1 you know to get parity up front and, and then try and they've got a lot of players in behind the scrum obviously um, Melrose that have got great skill set great experience but just not able to, to, to grind out these results at the moment and they've uh, perhaps just um, played themselves out of the title race. Let's have a look at that table then. National 1, air at the top. Played 7, won 7, can't argue with that. 125 points difference and uh, five try bonuses along the way. They're on 33. Second, Highland, uh, played 7, won 6, 27 points. Now Glasgow Arkies in third position and a game in hand. They're on 22. Melrose in fourth place, 18 points for them. The same amount as GHA in fifth place, but GHA have a game in hand. Dundee now up to sixth uh, with 15 points. Watsonians in seventh with 14. Gala in eighth on 13. GHK ninth on 13. And Bigger at the bottom. Still no wins. Six points for them. They do have that game in hand, though. But uh, very, very congested, isn't it? From uh, Melrose in fourth down to GHK in ninth position. That's uh, six clubs, five points separating them yeah and I think you know it just shows the in, in national one obviously in the last few years we've seen a really competitive league at the top maybe four five teams you know going on a good run being able to keep it tight at the top but this season you know obviously they're running away with it and other teams are just picking points off each other you know that's uh it's a really turbulent league in terms of results coming through but 
you know, the one consistent thing that's happened, unfortunately, for Bigger this season is they've been the team that have yet to pick up a victory in that division. Four losing bonus points, though. Yeah, four losing bonus points, but they're still losing bonus points. They're getting close, but they're still not being able to p- pick up a victory. So, great that you're picking up bonus points and they might be vital come the end of the season. It, it shows that they're getting close, but it also highlights the fact that they can't, they're not being able to win. Whereas Orkney in uh, Division 3, the opposite. Yeah, there's other teams. Yeah. Orkney's a great example because they've had four really tight victories that they've been able to see see out and you think about Ayr as well they've been involved in tight games that they've been able to get them to the other side and one of them was against Bigger as well so you know there's been games where Bigger have been close or been on the cusp of victory that they've then just not been able to see it through so yeah losing bonus points it is great you know they've obviously got two try bonuses there as well but the stark thing there is that it's a losing bonus point and if it keeps in that habit that they won't matter for much Well, this Saturday's games in National 1, starting with Ayr against Highland, first against second. Let's hear from Ayr head coach Grant Anderson. Thoughts on last Saturday was a frustrating one for us because, like I'd said to you, it was probably our strongest team on paper, but we just didn't execute. We didn't execute an attack. We didn't function in D, if I'm honest. And then, you know, experienced guys were then making individual mistakes, which then caused a wee bit of negativity and frustration throughout the squad. It's a good challenge for our squad to try and come back from that. You know, we had quite straight talking words at half time, let's say. Um, and we got a wee bit of a reaction in the second half and then we managed to build a wee bit of momentum towards the end of the game. And then obviously we were managing our forwards got on top of their forwards. I think they tired. We managed to get over the line. And then Jamie Bova, who I actually had put on the bench for the game, he came on at half time, made a positive impact and then rescued us again from the touchline. So I was immensely proud of his ability to come on and do that, keep a cool head. The game itself probably wasn't a great brand of rugby. We only made 68 tackles, which I think tells you what GHA had offered in terms of attack. Certainly our defence wasn't where it should have been, and certainly our own attack, like I said, it didn't really function. We didn't play in the right areas, and we didn't play the way we wanted to, and certainly the way we had set out to on Thursday night. So. Looking ahead to this Saturday, it's just another week for us. We're not getting caught up in the whole numbers game or who's where or at this stage of the season. It's just another week for us. So we've hopefully learned from things that we didn't do well last Saturday. So we've had some quite honest conversations. We've been quite focused in our training last night. So we're looking forward to Highland coming down. But for me, very much just another chance to right the wrongs of last week, really. Um, another chance for us to go and put on a performance another chance to entertain our home crowd obviously looking to get another win we'll have one or two changes in personnel just again other guys coming back from injury reshaping a wee bit and what we're trying to do in our attacking system Um, and hopefully our defensive system will function the way we know it can and um, we'll end up on the right side of the scoreboard on Saturday afternoon Grant Anderson backlash from air for this week or will Highland reduce the gap on the league leaders and be the first team to be air this season? I'm I'm not going to put a prediction on this I, for the reason that I've seen the results I've not been able to watch the teams you know live or see much from either squad this season so you can only go off the results Air have been in irresistible form you know being able to win tight games they've obviously been able to put a couple of teams to the sword as well but Highland have been steady which is something that is perhaps not two words that you'd have in the same sentence before because being steady you know it's shown that at home and away they've been able to you know be consistent at least yes they've been defeated but you know this is a, a great weekend from this is going to be you know we, we spoke about it last weekend if Highland weren't able to pick up the victory then you know there's a there's a sizable gap at the top of the division it rolls on to this week because if, if they're not able to pick up the victory against Ayr then there is the sizable gap because nobody can go above Highland in terms of um points tally uh, so yeah there'll be a, a huge chasm in between air and the rest of the te- the rest of the teams in the in the league if they if they manage to get the victory Dundee against Melrose. Dundee going in the right direction, as we've heard already. Melrose coming off the back of two uh, uh, sizable losses. Here's Melrose head coach Ian Chisholm. Last weekend's result at home was, was, was brutally disappointing. I think you know, we started really poorly. We clawed the game back and there was a time, there was there was points where it looked like Glasgow Aki's were going to break and, and, and that we were on top and we had all the momentum. Got back to 28 all and then we had a couple of opportunities to score and never took them and you know the tr- the trend of the season. It has it's been it's been us that have that have went up a gear in the last twenty minutes of the games, and this was this was the opposite way around. You know, Glasgow Arkies really up to tempo a bit. We just fell off the face of the earth. There was a lot of mental errors. 
Few of our guys struggled to stay in the game, and I probably made a few replacements, which 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 hurt us rather than helped us. And selection is going to be interesting this week. You know, do we do we back the guys and just reassure them that it was just a just an off week, or do we bring in whole changes? And that's the big conversation that we're having with our coaching group at the moment. But look, at this weekend's an opportunity for us to to get back on track. Um, we. We're, we're travelling away up to Dundee. The weather's to be poor, and you know, sometimes the, that can be a real leveller when it comes to how teams want to play. And we're going with as strong a side as we can get. We, we've got Dougie Crawford dropping out of the squad this week. He is away. Bruce Colvin slightly to drop out of the squad as well. He's he's struggling with an injury. However, we do welcome Finn Barry back into the fold. We're unsure whether he'll he'll be, he'll be selected or not yet, but we're pretty pleased with how our front row went last week. You know, it's the it's the first time. This season that we've been able to launch off uh, off off of scrums and if anybody who was at the game they would they would be really impressed by our scrum attack. We scored or we made line breaks off the majority of scrums that we had. Um, it was just our line out that suffered. We had you know three line outs in the Glasgow Aki's five meter line that all went the other way or we, we made errors off it and. Other games this season, we'd have scored off them. I think our driving mall's a real weapon for us, and it, it was just really disappointing. And, and you just think about how the game would have went if our if our lineup was functioning. It wasn't throwing or anything. It was missed lifts. It was miscommunication. Um, and the boys have, have really stuck in this week, and they're really they're really driving it and owning this themselves and making sure that something like that never happens again. Ian Chisholm, and that result against Ackies will have certainly hurt Ian and the players for sure. Can they turn it around though against Dundee? It's at Dundee. As you said before, Dundee have had three victories so far this season and they, they did get off to a difficult start and we perhaps thought they were going to be, potentially could have been the basement boys in this division, but you know that mantle's been taken just now by Bigger. So they'll go into it with confidence and, and I think Melrose will go in with it now with a little less confidence. It's all fair and well, perhaps being defeated once and then twice, but at home they have had a couple of, a couple of really difficult results. The caveat to that is away from home, Against Bigger, they put in a really good performance and got a, a, a good result. They didn't concede as well. So, you know, Melrose can travel, um, but it's it's a, it's an intriguing game, I think. You know, it's a really difficult to call. You would say, looking at it, if you're if you you're going with limited knowledge and you look at the league table and the, the prestige that Mel, Melrose have, you would say Melrose going to favourites, but it's, a, it's going to be a difficult game. GHA versus GHK, a reporter's nightmare describing this one. I have problems every single week. But you have to say that GHA will start favourites with home advantage and a good performance against Air last week. But GHK's comeback against Watsonians will have done them no harm at all. Yeah, it's probably going to be a difficult one for me to analyse right now as well. But, you know, GHA have came down from the Premiership and I've said it time after time. So they come down with a, a, a lot of experience perhaps not had the, the best start to life in National 1. You know, getting relegated, you're always going to have to change your squad and your, your club changes and there's a, a few things that you need to go through to try and steady the ship. But, you know, they, they come into this, the, the more experienced campaigners. GHK, on the other hand, you know, have been rising up through the leagues over the last few years and, you know, potentially just now they're they're not in the best position in the table. But, you know, it's a... It's a Glasgow ding dong, so I'm I'm sure it'll be. You know that we've seen them before with with likes of Aki's. I think it was GHK they played. You know, sixty eight five at GHK. There we go. You're like Rain Man because that's just came off the top of your head. But it, they, yeah, the, you know they put in a really. We thought it'd be tighter, and they've they've absolutely thumped them, and then being able to thump Melrose as well. So you know Glasgow Aki's certainly are the, the pick of the bunch just now. But these two teams, you know, you you would expect them to get up for the occasion, and it'll be a tight Glasgow derby. Glasgow Ackies versus Gala. Last two games, they scored over 60 points on the road. That's Ackies, of course. They're now back home facing Gala in eighth place. Let's find out what Gala Director of Rugby Ewan Swinton has to say this week. Last Saturday's game ended in a, an absolutely gut-wrenching way for Gala. We were well on top in the game against Highland. We were 18-3 up with just over five minutes to go and attack were defending resolutely. Highland were not looking like scoring until we lost a centre to an offside decision which resulted in a yellow card. That created space out wide which Highland were, to their own credit, were good enough to take advantage of and that 18-3 lead disappeared very quickly and became the defeat that was recorded. Uh, so yeah, devastating in itself but uh, 
but not the end of the world. I'm a great believer in the poetry of sport. It's full of triumph and tragedy in the sporting context. Um, you have highs and lows. Highland certainly had a high at the end of the game on Saturday and we had a low. However, it's not terminal. Uh, the boys have to remember that they were on top of a team which is doing very well for these 75 minutes. And at the point that we were even handed, we were on top uh, for, for the vast majority of the game. The Highland management were almost embarrassed at the end. Um, however, they, they took their, their high, and, and quite rightly so. They, they were green enough to take advantage of a situation which presented itself. But we cannot forget that a very young group of lads who had been subject to a number of call-offs were well and truly on top in the game until things just ran away from them in a manner that sometimes happens in rugby and indeed in all sport. It's part of the beauty of sport, hard to take, but you simply have to do that and move on. So that's what we'll do. We now head up to, to Glasgow Ackies, who are going great guns, uh, had a fantastic result at the Green Yards on Saturday, uh, and on the face of it, it's a daunting challenge. But uh, I choose to take the positive view. We still do have an excellent uh, crop of young players. We will have uh, a fair bit of bulk returning to the forwards. Tim McAvan and hopefully Cami Pate will be back in the reckoning for this weekend. Um, and hopefully Angus Dunn will return from injury as well. These three, along with uh, any other changes that come along when the final selection is made, will make quite a difference. Our backs are very capable. We perhaps need a wee bit more control that will come with experience and indeed confidence. Aki's are, are going tremendously well. They're very well coached. They're a very well led club and they're very much on the up. I'm not unrealistic about the challenge that we face, but I am extremely positive about the group that we have. The, the major, major lack that we have at the moment is the confidence that comes with winning. And there's only one way to get it, and that's to, to roll up your sleeves, absolutely knock your pan in and go for it. And that is the attitude that we'll take up to Glasgow on Saturday. Um, I'm not going to be silly about uh, predictions, but I am going to say that I am confident in our group of young players uh, and that they will come good and there is no reason why they shouldn't go up to Glasgow on Saturday and make a statement about themselves and come away with the win. That's the attitude we'll take there and hopefully the result will mirror that. Ewan Swinton, big test for Gala this week after two home losses against one of the surprise packages really in Glasgow Ackies. Let's not forget they were playing in National 2 last season. Yeah, they were. And, uh, you know, it was obviously a great finish to the league in National 2 last year as well because the likes of, you know, Falkirk were there or thereabouts. I think Newton Stewart were the other team that could potentially go up. So, you know, they were the team that managed to snatch it in the last day in dramatic fashion as well. So, you know, Glasgow Ackies are, are thriving in National 1 and you feel that, you know, another victory uh, this weekend it does keep them towards the top of the table. You know, I, I do think it's going to be huge. I don't want to write off the league early on, but, you know, it's going to be a huge effort to get back in touch with air. But, you know, that, getting that consistency and getting another victory uh, will do them the world of good. But Gal, on the other hand, you know, they've, they've been inconsistent, but they've, they have impressed in, in flashes this season in uh, National 1. But, you know, I, I, it's going to be difficult to go on the road to Glasgow Ackies because they've been scoring points. And that's the that's the daunting thing when you go up, when you go away from home, or when you're playing at home as well, but especially when you go away from home against a team who are a bit of an unknown quantity to all these sides in this division, um, or most of them at least, you know, when you're going and you're seeing the scores that they're putting on, your your fear is defence and you start focusing on defence. And bearing in mind, Gala have been leaky in defence as well. So, you know, you, you think it might be a, another good afternoon for, for Glasgow Ackies. And how important is it having uh, Ryan Grant and Rory Jackson in your coaching staff, former Scottish internationals? I mean, that, that's got to give the youngsters an awful lot of confidence. I think it is, it is really important to have players of that ilk coming back into the club game. You know, we've seen it before with players perhaps before the, the, the semi-pro stuff, but they were perhaps played for the likes of Ayr or, you know, Heriots or Melrose. And then when things have changed, we did see a lot of the players scatter back to their, their previous clubs or go somewhere else that there was perhaps more incentive or more opportunity. But the professional players coming back in are brilliant because they've been in that environment where rugby is their job and rugby is their their day-to-day -day business. They know it, they understand it. They've been working with some of the best personnel in the country whose rugby is their job. And they're going into an environment where rugby isn't their job, rugby's their hobby. 
but anything that you can do to get some knowledge and understanding and, and improve your outlook on rugby is instrumental. And there's no better people to do it than the ex-professional rugby players coming back into the, the club environment. I remember Mark Robertson came to Peebles at a time when we had a, a slight ch- change in coaching. He almost, he was doing it through Edinburgh, but he, he almost became our head coach because he just had a simple philosophy of rugby, didn't overcomplicate it, and he taught you a lot of things that you would never ever think of, because I was an electrician during the day, and then when I was going to the gates to train at night, I was getting spoken to by a rugby professional, telling me how I should be going about my business, and you you absorb all that, because they have a completely different outlook, they're not volunteers as such, they are really intelligent rugby individuals, and you know, especially the balance here, you've got a fly half, and a a forward, an ex-British lion, you know, going back to a club to, to lend some experience. So it's it's invaluable for those youngsters and, and good role models to look up to. The other game is Watsonians against Bigger, 7th versus 10th at the start of the season. You had to fancy both of them to be in that top half of the table. It's not what's actually happened, and they've both played six games so far, stuck in the bottom half, and as we've mentioned already, Bigger without a win. Yeah, I think the, the game against Gala was probably a big kind of eye-opener and thinking that well, Watsonians might mean business this year, but... You know, both of those teams are pretty much beside each other in the table towards the foot. Bigger, I would never, I'd never seen it coming. I did, I, I, they've almost got this similar-ish squad. Um, lost a couple of players, but yeah, it's been a complete change in character at Hartree Mill um, in terms of results. Anyway, you know, I don't know what the, I don't know what the, the, the kind of overarching issues are at Hartree Mill at the moment, but they just cannot get a victory. You know, we did allude to it before about losing bonus points, but. I think that the important thing there is the word losing. Like, they're still losing games. And away from home again, they will fancy their chances against Watsonians because they've got a they've got a lovely, expansive brand of rugby at Myers' side. It's kind of testament to the, the older squads that they've got. So this might be a favourable game for bigger, but you never ask for a prediction. But if you're looking for who goes in this favourites, you've got to say Watsonians because they've had a few victories this year. And I think if you uh, look at Watsonians and what happened last week, I think if they do even think about getting the foot off the gas once they've got a lead, they'll certainly be keeping it on this time. Yeah, and I think as well that you look at the points that the teams have been able to accumulate so far, we're probably at a stage of the season where it's a reasonable indicator as to how the teams are performing. Bigger haven't been able to get many sizable point tallies in a game where... Watsonians have on occasion so we know they can score tries we know that they can keep the scoreboard ticking over Bigger haven't been able to do that so that makes it it does make it a, a really interesting fixture uh, again a difficult one to call but you know it's it's, it's almost desperate times for, for Bigger because even a victory a bonus point victory doesn't take them off the foot of the table all right, let's move into National 2. Only two games last weekend, both delayed seven days due to the weather the previous week. Aberdeen Grammar 15, Berwick 12. Both without a win before this match and until a late try by Aberdeen to see it looked like Berwick would come from behind to win this one, but Berwick just above Aberdeen in the table still on points difference. Yeah, we, we did say it was a, a huge, huge game. Uh, going into the last weekend and there was a lot wrapped around it as well in terms of uh, personnel and logistics of of getting to Aberdeen and obviously the rearranged fixture and asking for dispensation but ultimately the crux of it is is Berwick almost were able to get away with the victory but Aberdeen you know they've been slowly improving and, and that's them able to get their first victory of the of the season so Aberdeen in the end they've just been able to see out the victory so you know it, it keeps it really interesting we have said National 2's an intriguing league. There's a lot of teams there that potentially could put their hand up for promotion and there's equally some that are trying to keep their hands down for relegation because there's uh, big fixtures coming up this weekend as well, which I know we'll get to, uh, but it's uh, Berwick have went there. They've been able to pick up a point, which it means it's only a three-point loss against uh, against Aberdeen in terms, of, in terms of league points. So Aberdeen have to travel down to Scremerston and I'm sure there won't be as many uh, barriers for both teams when it, it comes to that game later on in the season. Stirling County 49, Kirkcaldy 26. This was the game that both teams didn't really want to play, but uh, Dispensation, as you mentioned earlier, turned down for this match, and the Aberdeen Berwick won as well. Clearly Stirling the stronger side, and back to winning ways after three defeats. Yeah, another team that's found it quite difficult to adjust to, to life in a different uh, a different league, um, but there was a lot surrounding this game as well, but ultimately they've uh, both teams have been able to throw the ball about, score a lot of points, and, and Stirling County get that win that we were saying last week if they get that win it's able to 
kind of crane their necks upwards and look towards the top of the table as opposed to towards the foot. But it does nudge Kirkcaldy back down towards that, that bottom end of the table. So, you know, again, I wasn't really expecting it from either side in the division this year that they were going to be as inconsistent as they have been. But that's the way that they are. And, and Sterling are able to pick up a, a win against Kirkcaldy. National 2 league table then. Let's have a quick look. Last Wade at the top played 6 1 5, 25 points. Peebles still in second on 22. Third Gordonians 21. Fourth Falkirk 21. Fifth Newton Stewart 18. Sixth Stirling County 16. Seventh Kirkcaldy 11. Eighth Stewart's Melville on 10. And uh, Berwick in ninth with 8 points. Aberdeen Grammar in 10th with eight points. So that's the state of play in National League Two. Top of the table, not affected by these two results. Valuable points for Aberdeen, though. And, uh, of course, Sterling chasing the leading pack with a much-needed win. Yeah, I think we alluded to that as well, that the, the games that went on in the, the kind of the fallow week was was not going to really impact the top of the division, but it sets it up nicely. All the teams of... Uh, you know, apart from a couple of them because of uh, front row cover, they've almost played the, the same game. So, you know, it does paint a clearer picture of that division, but it sets stuff up nicely going into this weekend. So this week's fixtures then, Gordonians against Newton Stewart, third against fifth. Newton Stewart getting a morale-boosting win over Peebles and Gordonians, of course, taking the unbeaten record of last Wade. Yeah, the, the Gordonians' last Wade result was uh, was a big one. It was an interesting one and it, it keeps things really tight at the top of that division. So Away from home as well. Yeah, away from home. We, it's a, last Wade is... A, is a really challenging place to play. The, the pitch, I feel, is quite narrow. Um, and you've obviously got the bank in, you've got quite a lot of spectators do get to that ground, so make it quite intimidating. So, you know, that result was huge for Gordonians, but certainly this is uh, home comforts. It's going to be a, a really kind of intriguing fixture because of Newton Stewart able to pick up that victory against Peebles as well. They've both got aspirations of keeping pressure at the top, so, you know, someone's got to give this weekend. And uh, Gordonians at home... You would uh, certainly fancy them, but Newton Stewart have, have slowly but surely been able to be a little bit more consistent after a, a wobbly start to the season. Kirkcaldy versus Berwick, two clubs not going well at the moment in terms of getting points. What does Berwick's Paul Pringle feel about it all? So last Saturday we were up at Aberdeen and what we knew was going to be a, a pretty difficult tie um, with a, a team you know scrapping with us at the bottom and looking for their first win. We knew they would be targeting this game um, and... It was no surprise, and it was it was a tight affair. We unfortunately we we lost fifteen twelve to a, a very well drilled defensive unit, and um, we turned it half time going into a strong wind, five nil down. We expected really then that, you know, the lads would st- kick on from there, and, and we would secure the W. Unfortunately for me though, our game management was pretty poor. We didn't play in the right areas of the pitch. When we did get our noses in front. We immediately let them back in again. Um, and, you know, even then, late on, we had a, a pretty kickable penalty to tie the match. And if, with two minutes to go, we decided to kick to the corner instead. We did think we'd secured a win with the last play of the game when a try was awarded. Unfortunately, though, the, the referee then went back for an earlier infraction and that cost us the, the tie. But solely we have to, you know, we have to look at ourselves there. It was... Um, for me, it was it came down to our game management. In terms of the other areas, so you know, personally, I don't think our front five we didn't really work hard enough in terms of being effective on the pitch. So taking on the carries, uh, making enough tackles around the pitch, and it kind of it then had a snowball effect on the rest of the team. So we had a lot to look at, you know, coming away from it. We you know we we've worked hard last night at training. The lads really are up for this Saturday. We've got a few guys coming back, so we hopefully we'll be welcoming back Jordan Jackson, Ben Nicholson, Cam Rogerson. You know, these are guys who will have a, a real impact on the game um, and give us a, a bit more structure in terms of, of how we approach the game. This weekend, we'll go to Kirkcaldy and on the road again. Um, to be honest, we're just really looking forward to getting this tie um, and really targeting that first win. The, the the lads are in a positive frame of mind, um, which you probably you know wouldn't expect after six losses, but they've all been you know fairly tight margins. Um, you can see that by our losing bonus points. We know we just need to keep tweaking and, and learning the lessons from the previous week, which is the key. Um, and the W will come, so there's there's no panic. It certainly is not from calling on myself. 
Um, we're just conveying that to the lads, making sure that we're in that right frame of mind. If we can keep the intensity levels high this Saturday, you know, make sure that 1-15 to we're putting the work rate in, sharing our carries and tackles, then, you know, the result will look after itself. So keen for Saturday and um, hopefully get that first W. Paul Pringle. Two teams desperate for points, a good opportunity for Berwick to uh, maybe nick this one, but equally Kirkcaldy, they'll be targeting it as well. Yeah, it's a, a really challenging place uh, to go, Beveridge Park, and I, I do recall when I was uh, getting into the first team at Peebles, we, we were in the same division as Kirkcaldy and Gal at the same time, and it was the three of the teams at the top of the league, and I think we got defeated by Kirkcaldy up at Beveridge Park, but quite convincingly as well, and it was it was always a torrid place to go. At the time, we were in like Division 3, and they're number 8, whose name is, is completely evaded my head, but like made it into the Scotland Club International team. That's how good he was. And, you know, that was the sort of calibre of player they had at the time. But finding things really challenging. And as you say, it, it's an opportunity for Berwick to, to try and pick up a victory and do what they weren't able to do to Aberdeen is, is try and get as many points as you can away from home against somebody who you're in a relegation battle with. Peebles versus Aberdeen Grammar. Peebles lost their last two games, but are still in second place in the table. Their head coach is Graham Patterson. So yeah, almost two weeks ago we were uh, down at Newton Stewart away. Uh, it was our last game and a really disappointing and, and frustrating performance. Both from the, the coaches and the, and the players were really kind of disheartened uh, at the time with regards to uh, how we how we went about that game. It, it was one of those games where we had three or four good chances and just didn't convert them. We allowed them to to dominate the breakdown with their their speed over the ball, um, and that was the key area which. Um, was the difference probably in us uh, converting those chances or allowing them to gain some chances into the game. Fair play to them, they took their, their opportunities, they, they kicked their goals, they, they, they kind of got into 22 a few times, got a penalty and they, they knocked it over the posts. Um, and again, that was that was a kind of key area in terms of points differential as uh, they were able to convert those, those entries into the 22 area uh, or certainly into deep into our half. The flip side to that is we had a chance to, to reboot over the last week or so and, and we've certainly done that. We went over that game as well as the other games and we've identified a couple of key areas uh, that we needed to sort of work on uh, during that week off uh, and to get us back on track and as to where we were performing uh, prior to the, that game and the, and the one previous as well against last week. So we've come up with a plan, involved the players, we had a good uh, video session night, seeing, identifying uh, and problem solving some of the, the areas that, that were going to be uh, important to us to, to turn this around in terms of this wee sort of mini blip in terms of results. Although we didn't feel as though we were uh, in dire straits or anything like that, speaking to the player groups, certainly the senior players, is we just need to get back on track uh, and a couple of key areas were, were, were vital in doing that. So we've trained really, really hard and I feel that the, the confidence has really returned, looking to worry about ourselves rather than oppositions too much and just going out there and imposing what we want to do on the opposition rather than worrying too much about what they're going to do. And going back to our fundamental games, looking at that set piece area, how can we manipulate the other teams round about that to create some good opportunities and then executing those as well. And that has been our theme over the past week and a half or so in doing that. So looking ahead to, to this Saturday, we've got a, a great opportunity to get back home against Aberdeen Grammar, who will not be taken lightly by ourselves despite their, their lowly position in the league. Uh, we've looked at a couple of videos of theirs. They play a particular style which we will look to shut down pretty quickly uh, at source um, and that should uh, allow us to then go on and, and win this game but as I say we need to be uh, on our game and that's the messages that the players have been given uh, by the coaching group uh, a few guys come back into the, the, the reckoning James Dow uh, rolled his ankle prior to the Newton Stewart game, so he was he was ruled out of that one. So he'll come back into the back line um, probably at thirteen. 
and Buster Davidson will be involved in the in the squad as well. He's trained really, really hard over the last couple of weeks and really impressed uh, myself and, and Greg Rayburn as well uh, with regards to his desire to get back into that first 15. He's going to be champing at the bit to, to get out, out onto that field and show what he can do and, and hopefully nail down a place uh, going forward. The other exciting bit of sort of selection news was we've got a young Ross Wolfenden uh, moving up from the Colts. He's been passed to play senior rugby and as part of his planned development, we're looking to integrate him into the first 15 squad. Uh, he's a player with a lot of potential uh, and if we can help him along his his way and his pathway to, to wherever it takes him, then that's what we're looking to do. But his skill set is pretty good. For, for somebody of only 17 years of age, he's very mature and I'm sure he'll do really, really well over the next uh, block of games uh, coming into that senior squad. And he's, and, and he's moved seamlessly from Colts training to senior training. And I'm really excited to see him go at a senior game and see how he, how he goes there. But I have full confidence, in, as have... Uh, our coaches and other coaches in the in the sort of regional academy set up as well. So that's that's a view of what we're looking to do at Peebles as well. That's a, another snapshot of us uh, producing uh, young players through our great youth system, putting together a, a development plan in in conjunction with the regional academy coaches, and putting it into place to to allow these players to to flourish uh, and hopefully showcase their skills uh, at the at the right level. Looking into to Saturday's game, we're, we're looking for a a return to a bit more expansive game, looking to to move that ball around. Certainly in the pitch that we've got, it should be good opportunity for us to use both our set-piece skills and our face-play skills to, to move Aberdeen around a bit and to squeeze them in terms of defensive uh, sets that we have to put together. It'll come down to getting the right attitude. That's maybe what's the, the biggest area and that's what the players have impressed upon themselves to get correct for, for this Saturday and, and we're looking for a good reaction after those couple of losses uh, to get back in that in that hunt for the, the top spot in the league. Graham Patterson, well this has home win plastered all over it on paper but uh, can Peebles get back on the horse this week because if they don't they could actually find themselves dropping a few places. Yeah, I think it, they, they definitely need to pick up the victory here especially against uh, an Aberdeen side who are potentially not in the, the best of shape at the moment, obviously able to pick up that victory against Berwick, but they're two teams towards the foot of the table, and Peebles have started brightly, you know, obviously the defeat against uh, Newton Stewart was a little bit of a, a sucker punch to them, but they just didn't hit their straps at all that day, I was I was lucky enough to well, maybe unfortunate enough to, to watch that game, I was just a bit underwhelmed by the performance, especially what I'd been hearing and, and seeing snippets of before, um, so yeah just not able to perform, but back at the gates and a nice expansive pitch they'll they'll be hope to go a bit better but again like say, Aberdeen Grammar um, you know you could see they've had a, a, a slight change in their squad lost a lot of important players um, you see Craig Shepard still in the centre for them as well who's been there for a while so they do have players that have got a lot of experience but you know there's a, I was just having a lot of look through the squads as well during the week and there's been a lot of changes you know there's been a lot of changes to the squad th- throughout the start of the season so you know that part- that potentially could start to settle and, and they, they maybe hit their, their form a little bit sooner Stu Mel against Las Wade this Saturday. Peter Wright's men having tasted defeat now, while Stu Mel have been making steady progress and play reasonably well at home. Alex Haggart is Stu Mel's head coach. Yeah, looking forward to playing Las Wade at the weekend. I think we know what we'll be facing. I think we'll be facing a pretty sort of attritional team, you know, a really physical team. And I think we'll probably have to mirror our team selection to, to cope with that. Uh, I think the boys against Stirling County highlighted to themselves the blueprint of of how to play rugby which is very sort of minimal in our own half and keep the ball and build pressure in the opposition half so you know we're definitely looking to to build on what we did last week against you know a really good last wade side and there's obviously a huge amount of momentum at that club which is awesome particularly coming up from that three and then building and and being at the top and that two since the start of the season is really impressive so you know, we've got to show them a huge amount of respect and really front up against them physically. And hopefully if we do that, you know, we can start playing a wee bit of our own rugby. Um, but then at the same time, looking at the weather forecast for the weekend and the storm that's coming, the the high winds and all that kind of stuff, you know, we might have to temper our own rugby a little bit and and really just get into a bit of a war of attrition. That's our sort of our plan for this weekend.
Alex Haggart. I can see Stu Mel getting better in the final two thirds of the season, but last week at the top of the table are a strong side, and Peter Wright's influence can't be underestimated. Yeah, I think we've always, uh, or I've certainly always alluded to the the structure that Peter Wright brings to to squads, and he's got a lot of experience in rugby. He watches a lot of rugby, and obviously in the media as well. Um, you know, he's got a lot of uh, good knowledge and good experience, and that's what he brings. He brings that structure and and direction to squads. And and last week, obviously, have had a good start to the season from that, but the defeat has obviously came in as well in their last outing against Gordonian. So. I agree with you as well. Stumel, when we, we covered the game against Peebles, um, I was, in Verleith, I was very underwhelmed by the quality that was uh, that was perhaps on show. From their part, that's what I was kind of impressed by Peebles, which is why I was so underwhelmed by their performance at Newton Stewart. But Stuart's Melville have started to really get a little bit more consistent, a little bit more competitive in games, and, and perhaps had a little bit of luck as well. You know, in that game against Peebles, there was a few injuries which changed personnel. Uh, you know, scrum half number eight, both getting injured, both having to be withdrawn, and that's a, a huge shift in the in the dynamic of your team. Um, so yeah, it's definitely going to be a, a challenging afternoon. Peebles were able to get away with a bonus point victory, made a hard work of it in the end. But you know, it's not an easy place to go. And last week will be will be doing well to come away with the same. Stirling County versus Falkirk. Falkirk have a game in hand. Could easily be sitting at the top of the table right now if their game against Stumel had gone ahead a couple of weeks ago. But what does Stirling's head coach Craig Deacons have to say this week? A really good win for us in the weekend for the players. I think it was a bit of a confidence boost as well. Um, you know, we've been on the back of a couple of really tough results um, after poor performances, and on Saturday the players showed the character to actually turn that around, and we, we took the game to Kirkcaldy, and you know we went some early scores up. Um, we went, went at half time thirty nine fourteen against Kirkcaldy. Maybe a wee bit frustrating was the fact in the second half we allowed them back into the game a wee bit. Maybe we did sit off, but for me that's a bit of a mindset thing, and you know we need to sort of challenge the players about that. Actually, when you know we're, we're on top of teams, we need to make sure in the second half we put them away. However, you know against a Kirkcaldy team which was a big, physical, heavy pack, you know they were they put us under some serious pressure at the scrum the weekend. A bit of a lesson for some of our young boys in the front row, but that certainly didn't kind of help us in the weekend. You know when we were in positions in the park that you know, we could have capitalised on and we're not weren't winning our scrum ball as much as we should have been. Obviously we know quite a lot about Falkirk, you know, they are a well established team. Um, they're they're quite a senior team. You know, they've got a lot of guys that have been there for a lot of years. Um, you know, they've been through the highs and the lows. A, a lot of really good experienced guys in there. So we know that we're gonna be up against it on Saturday against these boys. You know, they ultimately they should be top of the table at the moment. I know they've got a game in hand, but should, you'd expect them to win that one against Stuart Melville. Um, so, you know, they're going to be coming to Bridge Hall this weekend, full of confidence um, and also a point to prove as well, because, you know, there is that local rivalry from Falkirk and Stirling County going on there. So, um, you know, it's going to be a bit of a physical encounter across the pitch for the players, but I'm kind of hoping that it'll be a, be a good learning experience for our guys as well, especially the young boys in the team. Um, but it's one that, you know, with the selection that we've got for this weekend, because we'll pretty much be a carbon copy of what went out last week. You know, we've not picked up many injuries. The more consistent we become with selection, we can be count now. We're not picking up the knocks and injuries. It's going to help the team's performance, you know, because it isn't good when we've got so many changes happening week in, week out. So, you know, if we can back up what we did last week against Kirkcaldy, and we can move forward. That's the big thing. You know, we are, we're getting better every week. You know, our, our discipline's coming down. You know, we're not getting as many penalties. You know, we're actually turning over less ball, we're, you know, we're converting our chances more, so the big thing for me is as long as we keep on going forward, um, you know, we'll see what happens for the rest of the season. Craig Deacons, now they found their winning form again, but uh, can they beat Falkirk at Bridgehall? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting fixture because it's a it's essentially a derby for both of these sides, really close connections. Um, Stirling County have been, you know, one of the, the top clubs in Scottish rugby for a long time and, and, and served our kind of national team well. Um, you know, for a, a long period as well. So Falkirk, on the other hand, have been coming up the ranks and have been there or thereabouts over the last few years. A lot of really, really good players have went through their club. You know, obviously we're thinking there about like say Finn Russell. There was an article the other the, the other day about his time at Stirling County, not getting opportunities, going to Falkirk, and then eventually his pathway was made from there. So, you know, it's it, the the clubs have really close connections and and have had different starts to the season. Falkirk looked stronger. 
Um, but it's 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 a derby, and Sterling obviously off the back of a, a big big win against Kirkcaldy last week, will go into it with a bit of confidence. On to National Three, then the results from last week. Some interesting games as well. Alan Glens at the top of the table, forty three, West of Scotland, twenty five, went to form. Table toppers only dropped uh, one bonus point this season. West of Scotland still at the bottom. It, it's good that the fact that they were able to see those. Uh, those results come through this weekend and everybody can get a kind of level playing field again. But West of Scotland are, are finding it really challenging in this division this year, just not able to, to get off that foot of the table. And then it's a huge, you know, a huge points tally as well. But Alan Glenn's again, just able to just uh, reclaim top spot and the top of that division is uh, really competitive. You look at those three teams in terms of Alan Glenn's, Orkney, PL, it's, it's, it's really, really competitive. And they've all got different characters in terms of the clubs. Like one's a really, in my eyes, a really familiar name, Preston Lodge. You know, there's there's been a lot of players come through that club and played uh, international rugby. Alan Jacobson, of course. Jacobson, I think Scott Murray was there as yep. well. And you know, you think of those players years gone by that have went through that club. Orkney have. You know, they're just a, a remarkable story coming from the you know, the islands and competing at a high level in national rugby. Shows there's a great appetite out there, and they have to commit a lot to play rugby, you know, you, you, that cannot be understated in terms of the commitment, where Alan Glens as well have, have been have been slowly you know, rising up the ranks, you know, I, I remember playing them in a cup game when I first started years and years ago, you know, when I was playing and uh, I didn't know anything about them, so it's nice to see them, you know, in national action competing well. Bottom you are 36, how of Fife 41, Bottom you are now three wins from six, how of Fife leapfrogging them, and that was a game played on uh, Friday night under the lights at Megatland. Yeah, it's good to see Friday Night Rugby is still in national action. I think there should probably be a little bit more of that. Um, you know, if the clubs get a little bit more autonomy to, to decide, um, I think there probably is a, an appetite for Friday Night Rugby in club, in club land anyway. But obviously, Burham Muir have uh, been able to accumulate a lot of points on the pitch, but just not even able to get that consistency. You see there a narrow defeat against Orkney, and then obviously how with Fife travelling down from the, the kingdom to be able to escape back up over the bridge with a, with a good victory for them. So, again, Again, how Fife have been a team that have uh, you know had a kind of plethora of good talent coming through their club over the last few years, but obviously over the last couple of years have uh, been uh, had to take a backward step and you know starting to build again and, and and try and be competitive and climb back up the leagues. The other match was Hillhead Jordan Hill eighteen Preston Lodge thirty four absolutely vital result that one Hillhead Jordan Hill also three from six now and a big win for Preston Lodge in third place putting pressure on uh, the uh, the top two. Yeah, I think I think Preston Lodge have uh, you know been able to shake off that earlier defeat in the season. I look a lot at their social media and see the the squad that they've got and you know look at their the kind of their second team that they're able to pop out as well and. There's certainly a, a good vibe at the club at the moment, so it's a good win, a really impressive win again against a team who is uh, quite close to them in terms of points in the league, so it gives them a little gap, and, and again, it's amazing what that does for a team in terms of what you can focus on is start looking towards you know the teams up above, building that confidence, making sure you get on good winning runs to find yourself in the hunt come the end of the season. I think Preston Lodge are the only team to play in the colour teal which is a kind of turquoisey green. Did you know that? They played uh, in their second uh, strip against Berwick. And, of course, the only other team that uh, I know to play in teal was the South African World Cup squad when they played uh, against Ireland, didn't they? They played uh, in their white jerseys with that sort of turquoisey green, which they couldn't identify on uh, the television, but I'm pretty sure that was teal as well. So now you know. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I'm... I'm I'm just going to write that down just now, but it's uh, yeah, good fact. Um, I didn't know that about uh, Preston Lodge, but and I didn't know that about South Africa. I don't think I needed to, but I'm educated now. So Fantastic! That's there we are. You get everything here on this podcast, but um, certainly Preston Lodge doing really, really well. Yeah, I think you know, as I say, they, they, they shook off that defeat and, and it keeps pressure up the top. There's some big games coming up in National Three. I think all the leagues. You know, apart from National One, uh, they look competitive up towards the top, and uh, National Three is no exception. And PL, obviously, in third place at the moment, but keeping pressure on the two teams at the top. So we've got Alan Glens first, unbeaten, twenty-nine points. Orkney in second, unbeaten, twenty-seven points for them. Preston Lodge in third, twenty-six. So very, very tight at the top. Hillhead Jordan Hill missing out uh, last weekend, as we've just described, in fourth place, but adrift now by eight points. They've got eighteen. Howe Fife in fifth, also on eighteen. Buttermuir in sixth on seventeen. Dumfries seventh place on twelve. Then you've got Hamilton with. Uh, eight points in eighth position. Carthage Queen's Park, ninth 
with seven and West of Scotland at the bottom there. Um, six points for them. Of course, Hamilton still not getting a win yet, but uh, four try bonuses and four losing bonuses, which we, we almost talk about every week. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the bonus points certainly towards the, the foot of the table are going to be really important. I don't think in the top of the tables that they, they might be as important. Um, because if teams can get on a winning streak and a winning run, then that will kind of take care of itself. But you never know. Um, it's 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 obviously it was important in uh, national national two last year. You know with the, with the restructure to the leagues and stuff. So I think it, certainly at the foot of the table, those uh, bonus points are going to be vital, and it's amazing to see them uh, Hamilton being able to accumulate so many. Carthage Queens Park and West of Scotland ninth and tenth. Um, they're certainly going to be concerned, but um, Dumfries not out of the woods yet either, are they? No, I think, you know, they're, they're definitely not because West of Scotland, I'm, I'm sure, you know, they've been able to pick up a win. Um, so it shows that they're, they're there or thereabouts. Like, you know, they can. There's, there's certainly teams in that division that they can beat. They're not the whipping boys by any means. And this league, again, will, at the foot of the table, will probably, you know, have a truer picture in uh, three games' time when we hit the turn. So um, certainly still a lot of rugby to be played, but Dumfries and... Yeah, you would say up to there, they're the teams that perhaps are, are starting to kind of look at the trap door beneath them. Well, this week, only four games as Alan Glens versus Orkney has been put back to the end of the season, 2nd of the March, in fact, which could be absolutely uh, vital. But of course, it gives Preston Lodge a chance to go top of the table. But uh, let's have a look at Borough Muir versus Hillhead Jordan Hill, first of all. Sixth against fourth, one point between them and crucial for both. Yeah, it's really important, you think, for Hillhead, Jordan Hill to react off of the back of their defeat last weekend that um, they do react and try and get towards the, the top of the table because if you feel a, a defeat here against Burry Muir, then they're almost cut adrift because the other teams will start to... They've shown it already. They'll start to start nudging away from these other teams and then one by one they'll go away. So Hillhead want to still be in that conversation. They want to be in the mix. So it's a, a big weekend for them and they'll be they'll be aiming for a victory. Um, but I'm sure Burry Muir will be wanting to try and steady their ship as well because being able to score points at home has not been an issue. It's their leaky defence that they're, uh, they're, they're really struggling with at the moment. How are Fife against Carthage Queen's Park, fifth against ninth, and you have to say a major upset if Carthage win at Duffus Park. Yeah, Carthage again are a, a team that's found it found it really challenging uh, so far this season, and you know there's a, there's an opportunity for a little bit of a shake up at the bottom of the league. We'll, we'll go through the, obviously you'll go through the rest of the fixtures uh, shortly, but yeah, if if, if Carthage Queen's Park can pick up a victory away from home, it's uh, probably going to go against form certainly. And how Fife will be want to try and get that momentum as well. You would, you would say they're almost in the same conversation as Hillhead. You know they can still realistically put a little bit of pressure on the teams at the top, but they would need to win this weekend to make that realistic. Preston Lodge against Hamilton, then third against eighth. Should be a home win at Penny Pit, but as mentioned before, Hamilton's efforts haven't really been rewarded this season, and they're a better team than their league position suggests. <laughs> Yeah, they're a team that you probably look at the bonus points and you've got more of a case to argue in terms of they've got four losing bonus points, but they've also got four try bonuses. So, you know, it's been a bit, little bit of a mixed bag for Dumfries. But, yeah, I do think it's probably going to be a little bit tighter than um, than the league positions suggest at the weekend during this game. Uh, the only thing is Preston Lodge looking really, really good at home. Um, they're looking like they're getting stronger and stronger each week and I think they're getting more confident just when you look at the kind of the results coming out, their social media, the way that they've got, you know, the consistency in their team as well. You know, it would certainly be a surprise if Hamilton won, but they can certainly, you know, make a, a good a good fist of it. West of Scotland against Dumfries, 10th against 7th, big game at Burn Bray, a good win for West and suddenly they could get to within a point of Dumfries. Yeah, I think, you know, this is one of those intriguing fixtures that, um, is going to be vital. Um, you, you talk about towards the top of the table, and you know we, we talk about the Premiership and, and making sure your home form counts to get that home semi final. But also you talk about making sure that when you're playing some of your rivals, you you don't gift them points. You don't you try and maximise that opportunity. And for both of these sides this weekend, that is an opportunity. So you know West of Scotland obviously um, have home advantage, but they'll be hoping that they can at least pick up four points and restrict the Dumfries from getting any. You know they don't want to be just you know going away with a two point gain or anything like that. They want to make sure they're getting the victory. But um, certainly Dumfries will be behind up a victory as well away from home and and, and try and you know. Kick what's the Scotland when they're down and keep a little bit of distance between them as well. 
Finally, International 4 then. Greenock Wanderers 41, Murrayfield Wanderers 40. Huge result, massive win for Greenock down in ninth place and their first win of the season. Murrayfield in six, but despite not winning four of their games, Murrayfield have picked up try bonuses in five of their six games so far and three losing bonuses. And again, in this match, picked up two bonus points. So they could easily be in the top half. And as I said, Greenock's first win of the season. Yeah, that was obviously a a bit of a try-fest in that game game and uh, both sides obviously are racking up the points but Greenock just able to squeeze over the line by by one point so it certainly it gives them their first win it means that you know they, they can start to build and, and, and try and get away from the, the bottom of the table like say Ross High and Persia around about there as well so um, but Murrayfield Wanderers certainly being able to score tries five bonus points uh, try bonus points at least is a, a good return and from the games that they have lost they've, they've only just not picked up a, a losing bonus point in one so you know you think the swing of games they could certainly you know with a, a couple of victories they, they could certainly be in the conversation at the top of the league so you know there's still a lot of rugby to be played this season so that tide could certainly turn in the next few games Plenty of points in National 4. Uh, Strathmore 40, White Craigs 34 was another one. Strathmore closing the gap on White Craigs to just two points now with that win. Both sides four from six. Yeah, another another high scoring one as you as you say. And obviously at the end, White Craigs you know, able to squeeze the, the couple of points out of it. But Strathmore are able to keep touch at the top with a with a really important victory. You do think that it swings the other way, then you know, you're having a slightly different conversation, but it's uh, certainly been able to keep things interesting at the top and you know all yes Garnick have a game in hand so there, there potentially could be a little bit of a gulf between first and the, the the rest of the chasing pack but you know it was an important victory for Strathmore because they'll be wanting to try and later on in the season pick up some uh, some points against the likes of Garnick to to reel them back in so yes, as you say, Garnock, uh, one game in hand and still the only club out of the 50 um, to get all five bonus points with their wins. 25 points at the top and uh, White Craigs, of course, in second on 24, Strathmore third, 22, Dunfermline fourth, 20, North Berwick fifth, 17, Murrayfield Wanderers sixth with 16, Stewartry seventh with 13 and then, well, 8th Perthshire, 9 points. Ninth Greenock Wanderers, 9 points. And 10th Ross High, 9 points. Yeah, tight at the bottom again. Um, you know, at this stage of the season, you're always going to see that because we've only played six games and you don't often see a lot of teams with no victories and no points. So there's points on offer. Some have picked up a victory. There's some losing and try bonuses in there as well. Um, so in most of the leagues, it's pretty tight at the bottom. The only one that's probably the, the kind of anomaly in that is is the Premiership. There's a bit of a gap between those, you know, the bottom team and the, the rest of the pack. But yeah, certainly tight in this league as well. And you, you think the teams, perhaps a couple of places above, are, are certainly we talk about Moneyfield ones there, they could quite easily be dragged back into that, you know, the, the kind of relegation conversation. But equally, you know, a couple of wins, it's amazing what it changes in the complex and the, the, the kind of layout of the, the league table. A couple of people have been mentioning about, you know, what's the ups and downs for this year. Obviously, it was uh, wholesale changes last season. Well, remember, the top four in the Premiership go through to uh, the ridiculous playoffs. It's one down in the Premiership, one up, one down in Divisions 1, 2 and 3. And in Division 4, three will be relegated, replaced by the three teams who win the three regional leagues this season. And it's worth noting that, as it stands at the moment, Perthshire, Greenock Wanderers and Ross High are in the relegation positions while on the top of the tables in the three regional leagues at the moment, we've got Pan Muir in Caledonia, Linlithgow in the east, and Ardrossan Ackies in the west. And in the case of the Caledonia League, we could even see a second 15 get promoted to National 4, because Dundee second 15 are only three points behind Pan Muir. And I don't think that's ever happened before, to my knowledge. Nah, I, I don't recall it, but obviously I'm, I'm about 40 years younger than you, Stuart, so it's not <laughs> happened in my time, but... Um, Panmuir, obviously, they were at the finals day at, at Murrayfield playing on the, the Dam Health at the time, the Dam Health, but they were there. So, obviously, a team that are on the up and having a good couple of seasons. So, they'll be wanting to try and see it through and make sure that we don't see a second team in, in National League. I think that would be strange. We'll have to kind of cross that bridge when it comes to it, but I wonder whether there's. 
you know, there's any scope that it would be the team, the next team down, or if the second team do get promoted, I'm not too sure, but um, certainly I think it would be a strange one to see a second team in national rugby. But you, ultimately, you just want people playing rugby. You just want, you know, players out there competing at the level they're meant to be at. The only thing is, it's quite volatile at second team rugby in most most clubs. So the team that get promoted this year might not necessarily be the team that's going to be taking the field next year. Whereas clubs like Panmure perhaps have a little bit more consistency. Well, this week in national four, it's Dunfermline against. Strathmore, fourth against third, two points in it, but uh, Dunfermline with that game in hand. Yeah, you know Dunfermline there, just um, just snuck in behind the kind of pack. There's there's the the four teams there that we're perhaps talking in the terms of the conversation. You could even stretch that to North Berwick as well at the moment. They've got the the game in hand as well. So, you know, there's there's teams in there a really tight top of national four that are going to make things really competitive but Dunfermline Strathmore is a big one in the, the race for promotion because third versus fourth you know Dunfermline will be open to build a little bit of momentum and then they can take advantage with that game in hand and put a bit of pressure on Garnock Garnock have Murrayfield Wanderers at home first against six can Garnock make it six out of six with a try bonus and keep that record up Murrayfield love to play open rugby so that could be a high scoring affair that one yeah, Garnick are obviously still 100% and they'll, they'll be tested this uh, weekend against Murrayfield Wanderers because obviously the games that we've had, Murrayfield Wanderers, all the games have been relatively close. Um, so they've they've been there or thereabouts and also Murrayfield Wanderers have scored tries. So, you know, if Murrayfield Wanderers get themselves in a position that they're leading and they get an opportunity to try and control the game, they might frustrate Garnick and it might be something that they've perhaps not been uh, too familiar with this season. But it's uh, certainly a game that, that Garnick start as favourites. Perthshire against Green at Wanderers should be interesting. Eighth against ninth. Perthshire with that game in hand and uh, home comforts as well. But Greenock thrilled with last week's big result against Murrayfield. Yeah, and that's, as I say, in any sport, it's amazing what a win does. It, it gives you that confidence and you can then start to try and build a little bit of momentum. But Perthshire, again, will we'll know what they, they need to do. We'll, we'll be very aware of the situation that they find themselves in and we'll be wanting to try and kind of stay clear of that relegation. So, so will, so will Greenock. It's uh, ridiculous to say that one team will, will be the only team wanting to stay away from relegation. But, you know, Perthshire do have a little bit of comfort and a little the pressure's perhaps off them slightly because they've got that game in hand. But again, with, with league rugby, you need points on the board. Both teams have nine points, so it's an important fixture. Ross High against uh, White Craigs. Ross High in 10th spot at the moment. White Craigs in second. Ross High are at home, but a big ask for them. Yeah, it definitely is a, a big ask for them, especially when you look at the landscape of the you know, the league table. Ross High just propping everybody up, albeit on points difference, but White Craigs are, are pushing at the top. They're, they're looking for promotion. They want to get out of National Four, so you know they'll look at this as an opportunity to, to get on the road, pick up five points, and then uh, try and get back to their home paddock and, and regalvanise for the, the next again weekend's fixture. A stewardry victory would uh, take some pressure off them as they, they try to get away from that relegation zone. North Berwick with a game in hand and a win for them could catapult them among the promotion challengers. Yeah, you know, we were just talking about that before, looking at the league table and those those kind of four going on five clubs and the going on five club is North Berwick. You know, if they are able to get that victory this weekend, it does mean that they can start to be involved in that promotion race. But... You know, it's one of those fixtures. You you don't pick up the victory. Do you start to do you start to limbo at mid table and and just kind of go through the motions and see the season through? So yes, it is early, uh, but you're you're then relying on one team, and at the moment, Garnick are that one team um, really slipping up. So it's a, a a really vital fixture for North Berwick this weekend that they can pick up a victory. But equally, Stuart will be trying to get away from that trap door at the bottom. Well, plenty to talk about today, and I think that's probably our longest Scottish Club Rugby podcast. But uh, that's it for uh, this edition. Plenty to look forward to this weekend across all five divisions. A reminder that Rugby Radio on Saturday will come to you live from Riverside Park for the first time this season. Bottom versus top in the Premiership, Jed Forrest versus Mar. There'll be television highlights of that on Borders Rugby TV, along with Hoyt Lindeen versus Hoyt Harlequins in East East League 2, so look out for that. And don't forget to check out the website at rugbyradio.co.uk for all the information you need on the 50 clubs playing national club rugby across Scotland. Now, if you want to get in touch with us, it's podcast at bordersrugby.net. But from Dale Clancy and myself, bye for now.